Hello everybody, my name is Marty, this is Atari Legend and welcome to a new season of the show. Today it will be all about Pac-Man. I'm not gonna bore you with the history of the arcade classic. That story has been told many times before and probably way better than I ever could. No, I want to talk about the best Pac-Man clone on the Atari ST and so much more. The original Pac-Man was released in 1980, actually the year I was born, so a bit before my time. I do remember playing the version on the Philips video pack of all systems, but my first encounter with this type of game on the SD were the spooky Pac-Man levels in the classic Time Bandit and one of my all-time favorite games, Crystal Castles. Which I guess you can consider a clone? Anyway, I lost interest until SD format released this cover disc. Snackman had great visuals and sound and was pretty addictive. Over the years, lots of clones were released, some were great others not so great, but they all deserve a separate video. The game we will be discussing today I only discovered at the beginning of this century, even though it was already released in 1993 by an incredible Dutch demo team. The graphics are great, the gameplay is spot on and the music, oh my god don't get me started on that one. So let's pop some magic pills and join me as I play a little game of crap man. In the second half of 1989, the Dutch Enigmatica was founded by senior and PR man Jan Willekens, nicknamed Zocatra. Enigmatica acted as an umbrella organization covering several Atari ST groups, most notably the demo team Division, which was born a year prior in September of 1988 and only released a few intros, and MCA, the Menacing Cracking Alliance. This last one started as a cracking group on the Commodore 64 in 1986 and later moved to the Atari ST to become one of the biggest cracking teams on the system. One of its members known as Crush or Mysteria will be very important in this tale, but more on him later. Enigmatica consisted of many talented individuals, with main coder Erik Alexander Zomer, known as Zanik, being the focus point in this part of the story. The group released its first demo in August of 1989 at the Atari Mesa party. This self-titled demo consisted of three simple screens with scrawler. A second demo was released in April of 1990 called Genesis and from that point on it all went downhill. The group also dabbled a bit in the world of journalism, trying to release an Atari disk magazine with superior user interface named Stabloid, of which eventually only a preview was released in 1991. By the second half of that year, tensions between members started to rise, causing Zanik to abandon ship. Enigmatica released one more guest screen for the fantastic Falion Giga demo by Group Next, which contained 34 demos packed onto 4 discs and was released in May of 1992. As a side note, the Falion demo is probably best known for its Shadow of the Beast inspired menu featuring 6 layers of parallax scrolling, open borders and 40 colors at once on screen. If only the guys at Psygnosis had known how to program in ST back in the day, like these talented demo coders could. And that, my friends, concludes the Enigmatica story. But from its ashes rose something far superior. Zanek formed Synergy Software Development in August of 1991, together with former Enigmatica member Thomas Erik van der Heide, also known as Bad, Newcomer Robert van Dalen, Rapido, an absolute 3D coding mastermind and finally Joris de Mon, aka Scavenger, the now legendary chip musician. They didn't know it yet, but Synergy would become one of the most respected ST groups out of the Netherlands. Synergy started as a very local team situated in The Hague focusing on each individual's particular skill set. Once they began attending coding parties in various places, it grew to be more inclusive and social. Each member had their own qualities and would become one of the jigsaw pieces. Everyone was unique and respected each other's capabilities. Together they formed a perfect puzzle. That is why the name Synergy was chosen and this ID was represented in their logo. Right from the get-go, a mega demo project was planned by the members, 
which eventually took over two years before considered complete. During the first year of its existence, Synergy released smaller demos and intros for groups like Elite. But the greater part of their recognition by the public could be explained through the chip music produced by Scavenger, which was featured on these intro screens. And by April 1992, Scavi won first prize in the music contest of the Mega Live Party in Sweden. During his time at Synergy, Scavenger was studying music technology in the city of Utrecht, but it started way earlier than that. He was raised in a classical music family, with his father being a professor at university teaching music. At the age of six, he started playing the violin, unwillingly. Later on, he had to join the school orchestra. But it was at home, on his ZX Spectrum, where Le Scaf experimented with samples and synths. When a few years later, a friend of his dad showed him an Atari ST, which he was using as a MIDI sequencer, the time had come to invest in such a new machine. On the ST, he tried Activision's music studio, MicroDeal's Quartet, and eventually the TCB tracker. But it wasn't until he discovered the program TriSound when he started doing chip music properly. A bug in this program eventually led to the development of his own tracker tool called Chipmon, which would be released in 1993, but never made it past the beta stage. Scavenger was a very talented composer, creating very rich and catchy tunes. He brought some of the most advanced compositions to the ST, with breaks, progression and rhythm changes. And apart from that, he was able to find his own trademark sound by implementing a Commodore 64 SID chip style effect achieved by using MFP timers. The Atari ST sound chip, the YM2149, was only conceived to generate a square wave sound over three channels. It sounds like this. But by changing the sound volume of one of the channels very fast with the help of the 68000 CPU and the system timer, the square wave can be modulated. For pulse width modulation, this is what creates the SID sound effect. The volume is used to generate a second artificial square wave, which modulates the YM square wave. The phasing of the two waves results in a progressive change of the original square wave width. Then you get a sound like this. This was never heard before and absolutely shocked the Atari scene. For his tunes, Scavenger was inspired by Belgian bands like Front 242, but also film music. And of course other chip tuners like the legendary Jochen Hippel and Count Zero. By September 1992, two Chipmon music demos were released containing a handful of tracks, which to this day are considered amongst the very best by many ST fans. After Synergy, Jogas went on to create the musical scores for games like Killzone and Horizon Zero Dawn on the PlayStation consoles. For that last one, he even received multiple awards. Meanwhile, Rapido, Synergy's math genius, started showing what he was made of. He released the Beatnik Part 2 demo. This was a simple ASCII file containing VT52 commands, which, when running through the ST's terminal emulator, would display a bouncing multicolored cube with rudimentary scroll text. While the group got reinforced with new members like Erik Sass, known as Stash, Arnold Kinderman, aka Wingleader, Thierry Bruinsma, Mysteria, and others, they completed an intro with a brand new track for the DBA Disc magazine. The group was featured in a full-blown interview in issue 6. Wingleader released a Synergy Giga Packer, for which he got critical acclaim in the demo scene. But it took till December of 1993 for the Mega Demo to be released. After almost two years in the making, it was time for the team to shine. And that they did. The menu of their Mega Demo featured a cube, which could be rotated with the keys. Each side of the cube would lead to a demo, 
intro or even an application. You had Pajaro, which was the biography of Synergy and featured questionnaires of all members in a disc magazine-like interface. Symbiosis, the only guest screen by Vulture and Digital Coolness, was a beautiful bouncing and rotating balls demo. The complete version of the sound tracker Chipmunk, programmed and designed by Scavenger, was also added. Even the credit screen was a joy to behold, with the ghosting effect on the animations created by old member Relayer. But the star of the show must be the side named Having a Period in 3D Space. This demo, which spans over 30 minutes, took almost one and a half years out of the life of Coder Rapido. The complete thing is rendered in real time and uses delta polygons. When displaying a 3D object, rather than redrawing all the polygons that the object consists of in each frame, Rapido's code worked out which parts of the frame already had the correct pixel color and draws the parts of the frame where the pixel color needed to be updated. It would calculate the delta or difference of the polygons between each of the frames. This gave a speed increase over just redrawing all polygons from scratch. He also used logarithmic math to avoid the multiply command, which increased performance. And every scene is accompanied with the most intense and beautiful chip tunes by Scavenger, making use of the new CPU-friendly playback routines of member Bat. Because Rapido discovered how pulse width modulation could be controlled in real time, all the animations you see are synced with the beats of the music. After the release of the Mega Demo, Synergy had plans to start working on the Falcon, but nothing really happened. Turned out, the Synergy Mega Demo was their swan song. The end. Hmm. But didn't I miss one side of that cube? Thierry Bruinsma started his journey in computers on the Commodore VIC-20 and the C64. When the 16-bit generation arrived, he had to choose the Atari ST or the Amiga. The ST was a very popular machine in the Netherlands at the time. And because some of his friends owned one, it was an obvious choice for him. Thierry was always interested in games, programming and the scene. The first game he ever played was Pac-Man at the arcades, and ever since that experience, he wanted to make a Pac-Man game of his own. So at the beginning of the 90s, while still a member of Enigmatica, using the pseudo Crush, he started working on his own little project. When Enigmatica disbanded around the summer of 1992, Thierry continued work on his game. When he eventually joined Synergy, this time using his nickname Mysteria, he already had a game that was very playable, with lots of the coding in place. Synergy were in the midst of developing their mega demo, and still looking for things to fill the sides of the cube with. When Thierry presented his Pac-Man clone, the team hesitated. Even though Synergy secretly harbored some ambition to work on games eventually, the idea of adding yet another Pac-Man clone to the ST library was cause of skepticism. But once Thierry showed the smooth and fast gameplay and the amazing split-screen two-player mode, the group totally got it. This was so much fun to play, they realized that with new graphics and music and a fun storyline, there was a real opportunity to make it their own. And Crapman ended up being the biggest team effort of the Synergy Mega Demo. Literally every member got involved. Zanuck did all the graphics using Neochrome and Degas Elite. Rapido and Bat helped with some code optimizations. Wingleader, Chrome, Arcade and Stash worked on the level design and the story. And finally Scavenger created the incredible music, including national anthems of each of the countries Pac-Man travels through. To build the levels, a level editor tool was also made by Bat and Mysteria. Crabman was completely programmed in Genst Assembler. But while the game grew bigger, compiling in Genst took forever, so Thierry switched to Turbo Assembler. Every frame of the game is copied from memory, Thierry explains. This was done for the two-player mode of the game. The playfields in Crabman were several screens large, so in two-player mode, each player could be separated from each other moving in a totally different part of the maze. When that happens, the relevant part for player 1 had to be copied from another memory location than the relevant part for player 2. So it was decided to place all the active game graphics into a large part of memory and calculate the game, and then constantly copy relevant parts to the visible screen. Crabman turned out to be an amazing Pac-Man clone, with silky smooth scrolling on each one of the 50 multi-screen 
open border levels bursting with vibrant colors. But there's more. Apart from the magic pills and fruits, there are bonuses scattered around, like extra lives, multiple levels of speed, and so much more. The attention to detail is mind-blowing. For example, when Crabman grabs a bonus, points are displayed on the playfield. When Crabman gets in the vicinity of these digits, they become transparent. Such a cool effect. But the best part is the highly addictive two-player split-screen mode, turning Crabman into the ultimate Pac-Man experience. Period. And a fun fact, all the ghosts in game were named after members of the Synergy team. But why the game was called Crabman remains a mystery. In two-player mode, a second Pac-Man character with baseball cap enters the game, called Capman. Well, I guess the Synergy guys wanted to goof around a little and added an R in the final name of the game. To this day, Crabman remains one of my favorites on the system and the two-player mode is a cherry on the cake. And that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy the show and remember, stay Atari. Bye.